Thank you. So yeah, I'm Todd, I'm with the Bitcoin SV Academy, um, and I'm gonna run through a bit of the material that we've got from some of our Bitcoin Primitives courses, which can hopefully get you guys just up a little bit of that technical hurdle to understand hash functions and their um, application in the Bitcoin system. And when you start looking at it, you just realize they're really everywhere and there's, there's a reason for that. And it is because of the integrity application of them and because of their efficiency. So today we're just gonna try to cover um, what is a hash function, why are hash functions used, where are they used within the system, what is a Merkle tree, and how does this all enable trust? So a hash function, it's simply a mathematical process that maps a bit string of you know, any length to a bit string of a defined length. So that doesn't matter whether you've got just you know, a one byte file or you've got a 4.3 gigabyte file, it's all gonna be compressed down into that same fixed size output. And that will be dependent upon which hash function is used. So the, the dominant one that's used in, in Bitcoin is um, SHA-256, and that's gonna map everything to a 256-bit output. So there's a difference as well between hashing and encryption in, in that hash functions, they don't care about the data loss. They're a compression function, and they're not reversible, whereas a encrypt, if you're going to encrypt some data, you very much need to decrypt that data to um, understand the, the contents of the message once it's been passed across that channel that you encrypted it for. So, you know, you don't want to get some information from the general and then find out that you don't know what time and whereabouts you're supposed to be attacking. But the hash functions, because they're compressing everything down into that fixed size output and we're taking, you know, any range of data values, there's always going to be that collision risk because there is only the 256-bit space for the output to be in. So um, you may have heard of them as a one-way trapdoor function, and that's that they're computationally infeasible to go back once you're given that 32-byte or 256-bit output to find out what input went in there. So it's analogous to um, you know, cracking an egg and then going, oh, I'm just going to put this back together or um, putting the tube back in the toothpaste, or turning that brown paint that your kids have made out of your um, three primary colours. And where M is the output bit length, so SHA-256 has a bit length of, of 256, it should take two to the 256 attempts to find out what input went in to generate the output that you've got. And they're a deterministic function, so that means that given the same input, put into the process, it's gonna generate the same output every time. And that means that these um, hash functions, they need to be defined by you know, rigorous technical standards that ensure that every time someone's implementing that hash function, they're going through exactly the same steps so that we can generate the same output and that can allow us to use it as its um, data integrity process. So if someone else is using a completely different computer system and this one, that they're still gonna derive that same output. And Similarly, if a single bit changes within that input, it's going to create a completely different output. Um, and then they've got that collision resistance. So despite the fact that there is that collision risk, because of the size of the output with the 256 bits, we've got with two to the 256 is 1.15 times 10 with 77 zeros behind it. So that's a, a huge space that we can generate in, and with that we can effectively assume that there's you know, a zero possibility of generating that collision, um, though it does still exist there. So um, under the hood, the hash functions, there's, there's quite a few operations that occur that, that make it that one-way function. So there's these bitwise operations, not, and, or, ex exclusive XORing. Um, there's modular arithmetic, there's logical functions, pre-processing, but essentially what it's doing is it's taking that um, the A to the H, you know, that, that um, bit string there, and it's slicing it into these units and then performing a, a, a range of uh, steps upon it. Sometimes it'll be shifting the binary representation, the ones to zeros and zeros to ones, and then it'll be, um, it uses a modular arithmetic, which is essentially finding the remainder and not being interested in what number generated that remainder. So 10 mod two is um, going to be uh, zero. Oh, sorry, two mod 10 is going to be two. Um, so is 22 mod 10 is going to be two because it's the remainder after it's been divided by a number. 
but because of that, um, that function where you can't know what number was divided by it, it means that the approach will take brute force to, to sort of figure out that, and then you've got multiple rounds of that occurring within the creation of that output. So I'm not going to pretend that I understand all of that, because I've seen the, the computer functions and stuff that are involved to generate that output, but you can sort of see from this diagram those, those different segments get put in, different processes occur to that, and then they get brought back in and they're shifted into different positions within the output. Um, and so this is just a little table that's demonstrating whereabouts they are used within the Bitcoin system. So SHA-256 is in the proof of work algorithm, um, it's in uh, address creation, it's in the generating the transaction identifier, um, RIPEMD160, so that's got a 160-bit um, output or, or 20 bytes, in, um, and that's used in the address creation. We have hash 256, which isn't technically a hash function itself. It's the name of the opcode that is used in um, generating the output, but it's just a double application of the SHA 256-bit function. Uh, and then we, can, we still have the use of um, SHA 512 in there that will, um, is useful for the wallet encryption. So the first place that we'll really look at where they're being used is in the, in the transactions themselves. So you can see here we've got a few, like, sort of, you've probably seen this image, it's in the white paper, but we can see that you've got the, the public keys, the private keys, the signatures, the verifications, all operating against that hash in the centre of the field there. So, you know, you sort of see that and you think, oh, I understand that at a high level overview, but what actually is the hash of the previous transaction that is, you know, going to be signed and, and um, that message is going to be verified. So this is the data structure of the sig hash pre-image. So the sig hash pre-image is the, the values of the previous transaction, the values that we're going to be putting into outputs going out of the transaction, and specific sort of lock time features and, um, you know, in, indicative value, flag values which will say how we've created the signing scheme itself. So you can see within this data structure itself, you know, the end version, then we've got the hash of the previous outs. So that's a, the hash of the previous outs. So the previous outs themselves is all the transaction IDs for, that have the inputs that we're going to be using, and then where that, um, the index of the position of the input that we're going to use. So when that transaction, if it made 10 outputs and we're using the 10th output, you give its transaction identifier and the index position of 10 but a transaction can have many inputs, so we've, we, can, we chain those together and they'll be in order, so the, the first input, the second, the third, and then we hash those to compress, if you've got 100 inputs, it would have been 3,200 um, bytes of characters, and we can reduce that back down to 32 bytes. Then we have a hash of the sequence value, so the sequence value is specifying the finality of the transaction, so if that input can only, it's the last time that input can be um, sort of iterated upon or whether it's, you know, the first one and that's really important in um, the payment channels, but ensuring that we're not going to have any malleation on that input being, you know, with that value being changed because once they've been put through that hash function and then we can generate the, the sig hash, which is the hash of all these values together, um, you don't want to be able to, you know, change any of those values because the signature is going to be a applied onto that message, which will guarantee the integrity of that um, data element itself. But another reason why we've got these hashing here is because we want, we're, we're working with a deterministic hash function that's always going to produce a fixed output, and we want to be able to pass this off to someone else to evaluate. So when they're, this data field, because we have these flexible transaction schemes, which are specified by the SIG hash flag, we need to be able to um, sort of create, use a standardised data length, which is that 32 bytes of the hash output, but sometimes we'll specify that there's, it's completely populated by zeros, and that'll be in a transaction where we haven't signed any of the inputs. And similarly in that hash of the outputs, you fill that field all with zeros, and it means that someone can then add outputs into that transaction after you've created the signature, without it invalidating the signature because that first message changed. So tomorrow I'll be um, presenting on digital signatures and we can sort of see a bit more of this process because it's a pretty 
tricky here, but it's, it's interesting to see that it's not just simply the transaction itself that's being hashed, it's a particular combination of values that are going in, values that are um, of, of what's being spent, and um, you know, to allow this flexibility in the Bitcoin scripting and the, you know, the, the rich set of transaction um, templates that can be used. And then the next place where most people are probably familiar with the, um, the hashing is in the proof of work process. So I've tried to sort of knock up a bit of a wireframe here of how that process occurs. But we've got the block header there on the left, which is an 80 byte string of some metadata about the block. Um, so that's going to include the version field, the hash of the previous block, which is the, the solution to that proof of work challenge. Then we've got a hash of the Merkle root. And we'll, we'll go into Merkle trees shortly, but that is a secure summary value of all the transactions that are contained within the block. And then we have a timestamp, and we have the end bits, which is a, the difficulty parameter on the, um, the proof of work process, and the nonce, which is the number used once. And remember what we said, we've got that 256 bit output from the SHA 256 function, so there's a number between zero through to 1.15 times 10 to the 77. So we can think of that as an entire number space. And then within that number space, we can, uh, you know, evaluate that most likely it's going to be a number somewhere in the middle and the really small numbers are going to be extremely elusive and the really large numbers are going to be extremely elusive. So we hash that, that block header, the 80 bytes of it, and check did that, um, the hash output fall within a very small space or did it fall within the bulk numbers? And that's, that, the size of that space, that little green square there, is specified by that n bits value. And when you get a, so if you get an incorrect value, it goes around and increments the, the nonce in the, um, the block header. And that's a four byte field. So there's 4.3 billion um, iterations of that nonce that you can use when all the rest of the values are static. But these machines are capable of um, hashing, you know, trillions of hashes per second. So there's another data field within the Coinbase transaction, which is the first transaction in a block that awards the, um, the, the block reward and the transaction fees and that's called the extra nonce. And then when you modify that um, value in the extra nonce field, you'll also change the, the hash of then that Coinbase transaction, which will change then the secure summary value in, as the Merkle root. And that means you can sort of get this extra range of um, nonce values to, to continue on that proof of work process. And it's also the, the way that the mining pools work is that they have that one static nonce in the header but then specify these extra nonce ranges to each machine so that they're not going to be duplicating the proof of work process. So you might say, oh, you do values, you know, one to 10 trillion, you do values 10 trillion to 20 trillion. And it means that, you know, you don't want the, the, the distributed hashing process all working using the same input values or they're just, you know, duplicating that process. And so this is just a little diagram, a little table there that hopefully shows the size of that number space. So we have that hexadecimal value, which is 64 characters of zeros, is the minimum integer that can be expressed from SHA-256 output, and the maximum integer is um, 16 or 64 characters of F, and F represents 16 in this hexadecimal um, notation. And you can see the different prefixes there. So the n bits, it's a compact integer, but it can be, ex it, it tells you how to put it into a formula, which is that the coefficient times by the two to the eight times by this exponent. And that allows you to sort of create this really large number, which is that difficulty threshold. So the current difficulty, or whatever it was a few days ago, was um, 3.61 times 10 to the 59. So if we see we've got you know, 10 with 77 zeros, and we want to um, you know, find a value that is under 3.61 times 10 to the 59. So it's essentially going to specify that there's 77 minus 59, which is what, what's that, 80, 18 leading zeros that will be required in the block hash to be a successful solution. So, you know, that's when we look at what, um, you know, in between or, or exa, exabytes there is um, 10 to the 18 zeros. So essentially there's that many hashes are being done to create the, to find a successful solution. So that's how many trials you have to do to, to find a number that's as elusive as the, the proof of work target.
So, you know, they're deeply implicated in, um, you know, the timestamp network, so the proof of work by incrementing a nonce in the block until a value is found that gives the block's hash the required zero bits. And once the CPU effort has been expended to make it satisfy the proof of work, the block cannot be changed without redoing the work. And then you publish that, um, that, that hash, but an, another entity only has to do the one hash because you've got your, your data fields all there. So it can be verified in a fraction of a second. So they're a really efficient mechanism for ensuring that data integrity. And because the hash of the previous block is an input into that um, pre-image, which is the, the data that is being hashed to create the output, it means you can't change any details from a previous block without having to redo all of the proof of work. So that, that 10 with 18 zeros worth of guesses. And as soon as it goes you know, beyond a certain depth, it's just practically impossible to change through that. So you can see here you've got the red nodes and they're competing with the green nodes there to um, find that proof of work. And you can sometimes end up with multiple competing uh, um, chain tips as they've all found a successful solution in a really short period of time. And they don't want to you know, just say, OK, yeah, you found it, yeah, you, you have it. So there's this competitive process that occurs. And gradually over time, you see the, the green one ex extends itself and becomes the longest proof of work chain. Whereas these other ones, you know, they're still trying to guess that number and are just left there and they either have to, you know, there's, there's no reason. Once they see the, the blockchain moving ahead, they will jump onto it and reference the, the previous, the, the latest um, block hash as their hash of the previous block in their header. And that's the mechanism by which the consensus occurs. You know, there's no other way to signal your acceptance of a block other than, in, than including its hash as an input into your header and building you know, fresh blocks upon that. And you can see there, well, this is the sort of the chain of the headers, and you've got that data structure underneath, which is the Merkle trees. It's moving a bit fast there, but um, that's the transactions that are being recorded to be, um, generate that root hash value that sits in the block header. So this is bringing us onto Merkle trees, which is the, leveraging the property of these um, deterministic hash functions to create a, a single secure root value. So the, the, the data set here is, you know, you've, someone's had a go at spelling Merkle a bunch of times. Each of those strings has been put through the hash function to generate those random characters as output. And then you combine the hash of the first value with the hash of the second and hash those together to create a new hash. So it's sort of, you're generating a 32-byte value and another 32-byte value. So you've got a 64-byte input putting that through and generating another 32-byte output. But they're always converging to create that single root value at the top. Um, so in Bitcoin, the data set itself is the raw data of a Bitcoin transaction. And those, that raw data is hashed twice through hash 256, double application of SHA 256, to generate the transaction IDs, which is this um, kind of content addressable identifier um, that, that um, a transaction can be referenced by, and it can't be changed without any of the details of the transaction, or any of the details of the transaction change, and you'll have a completely different identifier. And um, you know, they're, they're first, the, the TXIDs are called the leaf nodes, and then you move up through these interior node values till you've got that single summary value. But you know, any point, anywhere that changes, a single, a, a full stop changes, or a one is a zero, or there's a space in, the, in the, the data string that went into it, and you create a completely different root value, and then that root value is encoded, encoded in the block header, so the, which is then protected by that, you know, one with 18 zeros of hashes attempts on it, so it's really, it, it creates this really efficient way of verifying the data integrity of the whole system. And a Merkle proof is, the way that you can do an efficient calculation of a single data element. So if we wanted to find, I've got um, my raw transaction data, which is K there. Um, if we have, we only need to be provided with a few selective values that allows you to regenerate or recreate that um, Merkle root itself. So I only need to be provided the transaction ID of its sort of complement um, pair. So the transaction ID of L, I need to be provided IJ, H, the hash of IJ, the hash of MNOP, blah, 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 and up to the root value. And you can see those dotted lines are the values that we're going to calculate in that Merkle proof. So I combine the hash of K with the hash of L, and I 
put it through the function and I generate the HKL and we can go up and this is really efficient. So in, in this system, you know, there's quite a few calculations that are occurring in this tree to sort of prove a single data element. And in this, a, a simple like linked list would suffice. But when we move into a huge transaction um, pool, so we've, if we've got, you know, four billion transactions in a block, we only need to do the, the log to the base two of um, four billion. So 32 um, interior, there'll be 32 layers to that tree. And each of those layers is only expecting to receive a 32 byte output. So for an additional one kilobyte payload or data envelope, you can pass off these values that allows someone to identify that um, the transaction is valid and recreates the same Merkle root that's in your block header as is recognized by the rest of the people on the network. And you only then need to request that the node can just tell if those inputs have been spent before, so double spent. So instead of having to um, create a big, big burden on the node to go in and dig deep and investigate, you kind of pass off this elegant proof that allows them to, to ver it allows someone to verify at the edge and push to the, the node without um, you know, really any possibility of spamming that there. And another benefit of the Merkle proof is that you can do this kind of selective exposure. So this lady here, Sarah Morgan, we've got um, you know, a bunch of different data fields um, for each of the elements of her identity document. And out of those, you can hash, you can hash Morgan, you can hash Sarah, Meredith, the UK, um, you can create a hash of her picture. And in a kind of digital identity system, when you wanted to go into a bar, you could walk up and you could provide, you know, you expose your picture and expose your date of birth and the Merkle proof. And perhaps the, when these driver's licenses are issued by the relevant body, they could just simply publish a index of all of the legitimate um, Merkle root values for all the identity documents they've issued. Very private, no one can use, um, go backwards and see any of these identity things, but it just has this public registration. And then you can recreate the Merkle root and say, look, yeah, I've got the same values as this data document, but you only needed to see that the photo matched who I am and that, um, you know, I am over, over the age. So you don't have to show the bouncer your, your address, you don't have to show your signature or anything like that, but they can keep a log of you. And if you went in there and you caused some strife and got into a fight, then they can, you know, put that through the, the right process to the relevant authorities and they can go back and, and petition the, um, the driving license you know, issuing body to sort of unmask that, because they, they issued the identity document, so they will still have all their records on their end, and they can say, oh yeah, that's Sarah Morgan, yeah, she's a known troublemaker, don't let her in, you know. And um, then, so they've got, um, oh, got a bit of a typo there, but the, um, the, there's some really good efficiency there in these big data use cases. So I saw the um, Certi hash, is using Merkle trees in their, um, you know, penetration systems. But this is um, just a little um, announcement a couple of weeks ago of what is happening with MetaStream, and that's Paul Chiari from Weather SV, and this is some of his suite of tools. Um, this is MetaStamp now, and he's working with Daniel Keane of Predict Ecology, and they've got these huge LiDAR sets, which are, you know, 230 gigabytes of, of ex ex intensive data. And normally they would um, publish, you know, just the value to the chain and you get that integrity proof there. This is the same data set. But if you want to have more granular resolution and um, specificity in your auditing, they've reduced this data set down into these small four metre by four metre voxels and created, which are normally 90 kilobytes worth of data themselves, but they've created a Merkle tree out of each of those voxels, which can then be um, recreated. Then each of those elements will be inputs into another Merkle tree, which is like securely summarized. And that means that that um, 230 gigabyte file can be securely recorded on the chain with the ability to identify where there is changes, because these guys are taking, say, a 36 square meter kilometer um, survey before a mine or something has gone in, and they want to assure that the, um, you know, the right tree count and such is there on the restoration process, so they can go right down into a four meter by four meter area and check that it's, you know, that it the, has the same um, data provenance that then they can make the case, hey, you guys didn't actually restore it to this original state and this state is still in its, you know, proven, proven integrity because it's been published on the blockchain with that timestamp. So um, these are just, 
This is some of the content from our primitives courses. We've got the Merkle trees, the hash functions, and we've got one on digital signatures at the Bitcoin SV Academy. So they're free. They're, um, they've got some rigorous assessment. They're, they're fun as well, and they, um, they'll give you a certification at the end, which you know can demonstrate that you've got some competency in these topics. And I hope to see you guys all you know, going through that and advancing yourselves and having more meaningful discussions around um, Bitcoin itself. So thanks very much for listening and hopefully see you guys tomorrow. Cheers.